wanted to take uh, the, the opportunity this Lord's Day to give a particular message of what's next in life as we turn the calendar pages. I'll begin reading in Philippians chapter 3. Finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you, it's not tedious, but for you it's safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. He's talking about the Judaizers who are insisting that to be a Christian, one must, if you're a Gentile, you must convert and become Jewish, and you must keep the Jewish law. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. In other words, it's not a fleshly circumcision, it's a spiritual circumcision. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. And now listen to what he he tells about his pedigree as the Jew among Jews. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, hey, top this, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, he considered himself what? Blameless. But what things were gained to me, in other words, the things that I used to trust in, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. For what end? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Let me say that again. He wants to, he says, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, haven't already arrived. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press. I like that word. I press toward the goal of the pri- for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Hmm. These are the words of God. Let's consider them together. Amen. You may be seated. I paused and read part of verse, well, part of verse 12 a second time. I want to read it a third time. Listen to verse 12 again. Not that I've already attained. He just says, I haven't arrived. Here he is the apostle of the apostles in some sense. I haven't arrived. I'm not already perfected. But I press on for what purpose? That I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. What do you think about that last phrase? In essence, he's saying, my life is defined by trying to be everything that God has planned for me. Have you ever thought about that? You don't have to answer out loud, but do you ever, have you ever thought about that? What do you think of this proposition? And I'll just kind of rephrase it. If Christ has laid hold of you for something or things in particular those things just might ought to be the most important things in your life. What do you think about that idea? If God has reached from heaven and put his hand on you, and if you're saved, he has, he's done so with a purpose in mind. Our job is to discover the purposes for which God has laid hold of us and to live our lives that we may lay hold of the things for which he has laid hold of us. There's a there's a way of saying, what about purpose in my life? Do you, think, do you think maybe those things for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of us, some of them are common for all of us, and some of them are specific for some of us. We'll talk about that in a moment. But do you think those things ought to define us? Do you think those things ought to help us choose priorities? I happened across a, a, a video uh, 
this week that made me laugh out loud, all by my lonesome. It was a little boy, cute kid, and he's sitting across the table from an adult. You don't see the adult, you just see the adult's hands. And the adult lays down $10,000 in cash. He goes, here's $10,000 in cash. It's all in cash money. And the little boy looks at it and he goes, okay. And he goes, and now here's something else. And he put two Oreo cookies on the other side of the table. He goes, which one do you want? And the kid didn't hesitate, not even a, not even a half a heartbeat. He reached right for the, and he goes, now wait a second. The adult says, this is $10,000 in cash money and you can have it. And he, I want the cookies. Two Oreo, I mean, not even a box of them. I mean, not even double dipped in dark chocolate with peppermint cream in the middle, but I mean, just plain old Oreo cookies. Two of those are $10,000. Now, the purpose of this video, and I'm, I'm, I'm only bringing this up so you'll know what they were after, but I'm gonna make a different application for it. They were after young people are frequently not in a position experientially or intelligently to make decisions for the rest of their lives. If you're under 30, you might disagree with that. If you're over 30, you think back when you were a kid and you think how many times you reached for the cookies. How many times? Now, they were making a political statement that kids aren't in, in no position to make drastic decisions for their own lives because they're going to choose cookies. But I saw that and immediately flashed on my mind because I knew I was going to be preaching on this. Here on one side of the table is everything that Christ Jesus has planned for your life. Here on the other side of the table could be a myriad of different things that are so much more appealing. They're sweet, instant gratification. What do you choose? Do you choose what God has laid hold of your life for, or do you choose Oreos? What matters most? I want to offer some biblical counsel to you this morning. It's going to come to you in four points. <clears throat> the first is, what is your purpose? After that, what are you pressing for? Or we use his words, reaching forward to. The third is, what is the prize you hope to attain? And fourth, what presses you to press for the prize? So here's the first one. If you're jotting down notes, what is your purpose? Verses 1 through 11, Paul's purpose in the first six verses that we read Tell what his purpose was, what his goal was, what his objective in life was before he was converted. And what was it? I think we could safely summarize what he said about his life before. His, his purpose was to be the most religious Jewish person that he could be, including stamping out Christianity. But once he was converted to faith in Christ everything changed. What mattered changed. Some of you, if you think back, depending on the circumstances that were surrounding your life when you came to faith in Christ, maybe you can relate to that, com that, that concept a little bit more, maybe some, maybe a little bit less. But when we're saved, priorities change. What matters is different. His newfound purpose in verses 7 through 11, and I'm just summarizing, but using his words was to know the Lord, verse 8. It was to be found in the Lord, verse 9. It was to know both, interestingly enough, both the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of suffering with the Lord, in verse 10. And then it was to be resurrected from the dead, which what do we call that in Christianese? being glorified, going to heaven. He goes, that's what I'm really after. What informed Paul's newfound purpose? Well, he realized in verse 12 that Christ had laid hold of him. He realized this wasn't a religious decision that he made of his own volition. He realized, and I love the way he puts it, he's, he's describing salvation. He goes, I was saved when Christ reached out and touched me. That's conversion. He realized in verse 12 that A, Christ Jesus had laid hold of him, and B, that Christ Jesus had laid hold of him with purpose in mind. 
That's why he says, I want to lay hold. I want to put my hands and invest my life in the things for which Christ Jesus put his hands on me. Does that make sense? What does it mean that Christ Jesus laid hold of him? Or I might ask, or of any of us? It's just another way of saying saved. We say saved, we convert, say converted, we were lost, but now we're found. There's so many different ones. But in this passage, being saved is, is described as having Christ Jesus lay hold of us. I love that, that image. It wasn't just, you know, here, here's your Oreo. Here's your cookie. You get to go to heaven when you die. That, I mean, that go, going to heaven when you die, don't, don't get me wrong, that's a great thing. But there's more to that. There's more to it. There's more to it. Christ Jesus had laid hold of him. What does it mean that Christ Jesus laid hold of him or to anyone, any others of us? When we were saved, it's because Christ Jesus laid hold of us. And what did he do? He saved our souls. He invaded our lives. I think it's kind of quaint when people say, oh, God is a gentleman. He never forces anything. Have you not read your Bible? <laughs> he gave us new hearts. Do you remember? Do you remember when you were first saved and, and things that m were meaning so much to you, maybe right up until that moment, all of a sudden just faded out and were not important. And things that you never gave a thought to, like going to church and reading the Bible and praying, now meant everything. He gave us new hearts. He gave us a new set of affections. And what are those affections for? For him. First and foremost, for him. For his word. For his kingdom, what did Jesus talk about in his parables more than any other subject? The kingdom of God is like. And when we become citizens of the kingdom of God, we have affections for his kingdom. We have affections for his church. Hey, and how about this? If, God has, if Christ Jesus has laid his hands on you and laid hold of you, he's given you new affections for the lost because if you were lost and now you're saved, you realize that other people are lost and need to be saved, and it matters. It's not just, well, everybody chooses his own way and it all, we all end up in the same place. That's not Christianity. He gave us a new set of affections. We want to do his will. And he did it when we were not particularly seeking him. As Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 20, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest or revealed to those who did not ask for me. Now, I don't want to quibble on this, but you say, well, I was seeking the Lord. If you were seeking the Lord, it's because he had already sought you out. Because the Bible says no one seeks God, meaning no one left to ourselves will do that. We may be seeking God's blessing. We may be seeking God's prosperity or whatever else, but it, no one seeks him unless he seeks us first, which is what John says about the love of God. We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. Let me ask you a question. Don't, don't respond. This is just inside of your own heart. Are you saved? Are you saved? Then Christ Jesus has laid hold of you. And by the way, I would just throw this in as a, as a little bonus thought. Think about what it cost him to do that for you. We spoke last Lord's Day about the incarnation, about the, the eternally begotten Son of God emptying himself to become one of us, to be despised and rejected and crucified so that he could save us. Think of the cost. It wasn't just an arbitrary, oh yeah, here, I'll put my hand on him and I'll put my hand on him, duck, duck, goose. No, it was nothing like that. He came with an intention to save those who were lost and so lost that the only way to save them was for him to go to a cruel Roman cross and die to pay the penalty for our sins. What a savior. I think you know this about God, but let me tell you something about God that you already know. God doesn't do anything for no purpose. 
We do. <laughs> we do. But God does not. He saves people for a purpose. The question is, what is that purpose? Now, the number one answer to that, the most important answer, the one that's above all, is in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, so that in the ages to come, that's eternity, he, that is God, might show, that is put on display, listen, the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards, the, towards us who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, the, the biggest reason he saved us is to put, and I think you could write this down, just to put his grace on display for eternal glory. Is it saved, does salvation not bless us? Of course it blesses us. But the primary purpose of God doing anything is for his own glory. In other words, God saves his people to put his grace on display for eternity. That's the number one purpose of God saving people. It's for his own glory to show. And, and, and by the way, when, whenever you ask the question, why me? That's a good question. No one knows the answer for sure to each individual, but I, I, the, the answer that I think works best for a general answer to why did he save any of us, any of us in particular, the answer is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he didn't come for the mighty, the rich, the, the wise, he came for the weak, the poor, the broken. The church is not an organization of the beautiful people. The church of Jesus Christ is an organization and a collection of broken people. That's why he chooses those, he saves those who are like us. Hope this doesn't offend you. Nothing in particularly. Us, just plain folk. God did not look down from heaven and say, I'm going to, like, you know how we choose up teams? Maybe you never did. You know, you get a bunch of guys against the backstop and you pick two team captains and they say, I'll take him, I'll take him, I'll take him. And you just pray you're not the last guy there. <laughs> God doesn't pick like that. God picks people who are broken. Jesus said he didn't come for the well, he came for the sick, he didn't come from the righteous, he came for the unrighteous. Why? To put his glorious grace on display. Not only did he save sinners, he saved, as Paul called himself, the chief of sinners. But behind that number one purpose, to save people, to put his glory, put on display his eternal glory, there are other purposes for which Christ has laid hold of us, speaking about his purposes for us. I'm not going to turn to it or read to it, but in Mark chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, we read Mark's version of uh, Jesus choosing the 12 disciples. He spent an entire night in prayer before choosing, and then he chose disciples, and he specifically says he chose these people. Are you listening to this? This is so important. He chose them to be with him. No, no, no. He chose them so that they could be the ones that would go and do miracles and start the church. No. First and foremost on the list, he chose them to be with him. And then later that he might send them out and do works. Yes, indeed. But it begins. We are, we're in no position to be sent out to do much of anything unless we are with him. So you can jot that down, to be with him, Mark 3, verse 13 and 14. What does it look like to be with him? Let me just give you a short list. If you're jotting down notes, A, to be with him involves Bible reading and study. When you love someone, you love their words. The Bible is God's word. And I'll just throw in real briefly, once again, I think I mentioned it last time, about reading and studying. Unless you've got time to do both, put your emphasis on reading. Read the Bible. The church of Jesus Christ is woefully ignorant of what the Bible is all about. That's why we lift verses out of context and create doctrines out of them, and some people even create religions based on verses out of context, because you don't know the Bible. Read the Bible cover to cover. I don't care if it takes you years to do it, or it takes you a year to do it. So, there's some people that read the whole Bible in 90 days, which is, you know, what? I guess they don't have a job or something. But 
uh, no, I'm not saying I'm not putting it down. But listen, read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible. That's what you need most you, to study the Bible. If you've got time to study as well as read, great. But if you have time to do anything with the Bible, read it. Be a, be knowledgeable about what it says. It'll be fresh every time through, and you get your study by going to church where the Bible is being preached and taught. Jesus, according to Ephesians chapter four, has given his church people, and I'm humbled to say I'm one of them, he has given gifts to his church, pastors and teachers. It's right there in the Bible. My gifts are different from your gifts. You say, I could never, you know, I read that passage 15 times. I didn't get what you got out of it, but I can't do what you do. We all have different gifts. Read the Bible on your own or read the Bible with your family. And if you don't have time to study as well as read, Go to church every time the, the Bible is being preached and taught. I bet you can guess what the second one is. B, what comes after Bible reading and study? Prayer. Very good, prayer. This is how we spend time with God. By the way, is that what you think of when you think of prayer? Think of, think of what I just said. Prayer is how we spend time with, with God. How many of you, don't raise your hands, how many of you time you think, oh, prayer, it's something I got to do? How would you like that if you're married? And your spouse says, spending time with my spouse is something that I got to do. You need counseling. <laughs> if you, the only reason we were with that woman or with that man is because it's something you got to do, dude, you missed it. You want to be with that person. Prayer is how you be with God. Spending time with God. Third, C is fellowship. Listen, I'll stand by this statement. If you love Jesus, you love what he loves. And Jesus loves his church. He didn't come merely to save a bunch of individuals. He came to save a people, a called out collection of people that he calls the church, the ecclesia, the gathered ones. And I dare say, if you don't have any affection for his church, please re-examine how much you love the Lord, because if you love the Lord, you love what he loves. And we wedge in here between C and D. For what purpose? D, write down the word sanctification. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 is the clearest passage in the Bible about the will of God. How many pastors, how many counselors, how many parents, how many people are asked by friends in the Lord, I just am trying to find what God's will for my life is. And look, there's a lot of details of that that are not just one size fits all. But there is one passage that says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Sanctification means the process of becoming holy. By the way, it's holy, not happy. And then E, purposes for which he's laid hold of us is the Bible, prayer, fellowship. For what purpose? For sanctification, that we become more holy. And the last one, E there, is for the purpose of evangelism. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Listen, God does the saving, but God has not only ordained who he's going to save, but he's ordained how it's going to be, and he has ordained that people who are not Christians become Christians when Christians tell non-Christian friends and family about Jesus. You don't have to have a slick presentation. You don't have to have you know three points and a sad story about a puppy. Is all you have to do is just talk about Jesus and see where it goes. Insert him into conversation. You talk about other things. You know, the truth be told, there's people at, at work that that talk about things that, and nobody's interested in it. You know, they talk about their hobbies, they talk about their, and everybody's just polite and going, whatever. So be that person talk about Jesus. And if they're not interested, that's on them. If you don't tell them, it's on you. Beyond these universals, which are for all believers, because we're different and we have different relationships in our lives, what do I mean by that? Some of us are married, some of us are not. If you're married, God wants you, one of the reasons he's laid hold of you is for you to be a godly spouse. 
a godly spouse. How many of you think about your relationship with your husband or wife in, in these terms? The most important thing I need to do is be a godly spouse, a godly husband, a godly wife. If you have children, God's called you to be godly parents. The most important thing you can do as a parent is to be godly. You got a job or you have other people who work for you. God's laid hold of you to make you a godly employee or a godly employer. See how I say some of these are true? And, and hopefully, I'm going to say most of us because there, there could be some, okay, who maybe this doesn't apply to. And if it does, I'm here for you. Do you have any friends? <laughs> some people say, well, I can count them on one finger. Listen, God's called you to be a godly friend. Not to be the funniest person, not to be the most popular person, to be the most godly person you can be. And by the way, how do you become a godly spouse, a godly parent, a godly employee, a godly employer, or a godly friend? By becoming a, a godly Christian. You don't need to know all of the details and have 10 points on how to be a godly wife or how to be a godly parent or how to be a god. What you need to do is say, what does the Bible say about being a godly Christian? And if that's not important to you, please, please don't make the mistake of assuming you're a Christian. It's interesting. For what purpose? For what purpose has Jesus Christ laid hold of you? I don't know if you've noticed this, but the world, the flesh, and the devil, they have all sorts of things that they want you to do. The world has all kinds of purposes that are being, mas being paraded, not masqueraded, being paraded before our eyes every day. All sorts of answers to what is my purpose in life? To enjoy yourself, that's the world. To have fun to make money. The list could go on. Listen, God's word says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If you are being driven by what the world says is your purpose, check it out. You're, you're, not, you're either not a Christian or you're just not walking like one. If anyone loves the world, the love of God is not in him. James chapter 4, verse 4, whoever desires friendship with the world makes himself an enemy of God. I don't make these up. These are in the Bible. The world says, you ready for this? Choose the Oreo. Quick satisfaction. Feel good about yourself. Be popular. Be financially prosperous. Look at none of those things are bad. But if those are the things you're, are the captions underneath the photograph of your life, you're making yourself an enemy of God. Some of you might be getting worried because I'm, I had four points and we're still on one. The purpose is important. The rest will go much quicker. Here's number two. What are you pressing for? Those words appear both in verse 12 and in verse 14. And then in verse 13, it says, reaching forward to. This speaks of priorities, not only priorities, but passion. You know, we look at these banners here. The smallest print on these banners about our church says our passion. Well, that's because that's the way it lays out by someone who does graphic art. And they look nice, custom made just for us. Serious. But passion is not the least important thing. What we're passionate for is the most important thing, but we need to be passionate about it. Is, is it our passion to honor God, to serve his people, to influence the world with the gospel? Is it, is it currently our passion, or is that just words on a banner, the smallest ones at that? Let me ask you this question. Was it once true, but it is no longer true for you? You're no longer passionate? You used to be. Look at I get it. We get old. Gravity starts to win the battle. But our hearts are young. Our souls are alive in Christ. And if you're in Christ, they will be alive forevermore. 
I ask myself, was it once true, but maybe your heart is cooled because you have been warmed by a passion for other things? We must be pressing on. I like to use the words that Paul uses, reaching forward, extending oneself, investing oneself, leaning forward like one, like you see the runners at the finish line when they're, they're, they're right there and they're leaning out to cross that tape at the end of the, end of the race. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says, the members of the first church in Jerusalem, I love the words, quote, continued steadfastly in several things, in the word, fellowship of the saints, and in prayer. Continued steadfastly. Continued means they stayed at it. Steadfastly means they stayed at it adamantly, tirelessly, unwaveringly, yes, passionately. C.S. Lewis once wrote, the only thing Christianity cannot be is moderately important. It's either everything or it's nothing. And I, I shudder to think how many times, maybe every one of us here has deceived ourselves into thinking that we can be one foot with the Lord and one foot in the world, and that's just okay. No, it's not. We live in the world. We got to make a living in the world. We got to raise kids in the world. We got to do everything, that, but we are not to be of the world. We need to be passionate about the Lord and not about the world. What was the greatest commandment that Jesus gave when he was asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. He didn't say about, yeah, fit him in when you have time. Fit him in when it's convenient. Oh, dear ones, may God grant us not only understanding of which things for which Christ has laid hold of us, but that we would also recognize the importance of being passionate about those things, pressing forward to accomplish the purposes. In verse 14, Paul writes about pressing toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? You can ask that question by filling in the blank, number three on your outline. What is the prize you hope to attain? If you're putting your ladder up a building, climb the building, isn't it important to find out if it's the right building? It's not just about climbing. It's not about getting to the top. Which building? The world is passionate about Oreo cookies, and I say that as an example. It's not literal. Of course, if they're smart, they like the ones that are dipped in dark chocolate with the peppermint goo in the side and whatever, but the world is passionate about the Oreos in this world. The goals the world is passionate about end in destruction. Conversely, the prize believers are to be passionately pressing for is being and doing that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of us. I'm asking you as this year, the calendar turns tonight, tomorrow, whenever you do it. Some of us are going to, you know, say Happy New Year at nine and go to bed. <laughs> talk about things that matter remember when midnight at, and if it does for you god bless you but i can remember when midnight on new year's eve meant a lot now it means i hope i've been asleep for a while <laughs> we do not reach for the goal in, in our own strength please this is just a little footnote here you can't do it in your own strength, but, you, but it's okay because the Holy Spirit indwells you. You do it in His. You do it in His strength. He indwells every believer. The, the same sentiment that I've been talking about is found in Hebrews 11.6. I know I turn to this frequently, but, but I, I like to, so I'm going to again. Hebrews 11.6 says, He, speaking of God, is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him, which tells us we must seek him and we must seek him diligently, but he will give the reward. Our efforts don't produce the reward. He gives the reward, but to those who seek him diligently. The reward is not merely God's blessings, but God himself. 
He is the rewarder and he is the reward. He is not only the one who gives the gift, he is the gift. Lastly, number four, what presses you to press for the prize? We speak of passion, the passion of laying hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of us. Think about Christ's passion. We already alluded to it, but I want you to ask, ask you to think about it more specifically for just a moment. Think of Christ's passion in laying hold of you. We just, we just talked about this in our last message, last Lord's Day. He set aside the glory of heaven. He set aside the glory of heaven. He was born as a human baby. Human babies are pretty... Um, dependent creatures. He lived as a human child and then as a man. What kind of man? A poor man. What kind of man? A man who was despised, a man who was rejected and ultimately crucified by the very people he came to save. So why did he do it? Passion. Not merely for us and for the salvation of our souls, but he was passionate to accomplish the will of his Father for which he was sent, which is to save his people. For what purpose? So that he might put his incredibly mind-boggling grace on eternal display by saying, look at these people that I've saved. You know, we talk about people who are really bad sinners. Man, if they got saved, they'd be a trophy of God's grace. Listen, if you're saved, you're a trophy of God's grace because no, you, were, you were no more savable than, or unsavable than anybody. It's impossible for a human being to save himself. It takes a miracle of God to, to the extent that that miracle involves the incarnation of Christ, the life of Christ, the, the crucifixion of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ in order to save you. That's how lost you and I were. And look what he did. What fueled his passion? What pressed him? What presses you? Our goal, of course, my friends, is not to earn God's favor. We can't earn God's favor because if we are his, he's already favored us before we cared The only correct motive, the only thing that should press you and should press me to press for the prize is Christ. Love Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his son in order to lay hold of me and of you. What's the correct response? Love him. Love Christ. Love the gospel. Let you be motivated by gratitude because of what he has done for you and for me by laying hold of us. I saw another video this week that kind of caught my attention. It was kind of goofy, and I know I'm going to catch it for talking about this, and I know exactly who I'm going to catch it for. It was a video about who's faster, which is faster, cheetahs or greyhounds. No comments. It was pretty interesting. I mean, I, I've i never owned either or had a lot of opportunity to study how they run, but it was pretty fascinating. This whole video, they showed them in slow motion from a dead stop, and it's just like, Pew! which is faster, a cheetah or a greyhound? A cheetah can run between 62 and 64 miles an hour. Gosh! I once owned a car that couldn't do that. <laughs> well, downhill. A greyhound's pretty fast, but not quite as fast. It can only run around 40 miles an hour. Good tailwind, maybe 43. But the cheetah can only run at that speed for about 30 seconds. 
In other words, the cheetah wins the 100-yard dash, but the greyhound wins the 5K race because they have more stamina. It's a new year starting tomorrow. It's just a day on a calendar. Yeah, maybe so from one perspective, but it's also a day to say, okay, what am I going to do in the next lap of the race called life? How am I going to run? My prayer is for us to run to win the prize in the long distance race of life. And the next lap is called 2024. Give you some things to think about, about maybe what you want to do in the coming year. Father in heaven, thank you for this time. Thank you for the attentiveness and the interest of your people in your word. I pray, Father, we've been faithful to what your word says. We pray, God, that you would stir us with passion. Maybe some of us, maybe we can remember when we had more passion than we do now. Restore the passion, Lord. You haven't changed. Maybe some don't really even know the Lord. I pray that you'd save them and change their hearts and give them a passion. Others maybe have thought it was okay to be moderately committed as a Christian. Father, may we run so as to win the prize of Christ. Amen.